Please rise, if you wish, for the invocation and the pledge. Dear God, tonight we are grateful for the arrival of spring, a time of renewed vitality for all that surrounds us. We welcome the arrival of seasonal birds, the bright green of cypress trees, the massive azalea blooms, and more. As we consider the matters before us this evening, help us to discern our obligations in requests being made, honoring our responsibilities to follow the law while remaining mindful of the concerns of our residents. Grant us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding so that we may make the best decisions for those who have entrusted us to represent them. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is a special city council meeting for the month of March 2024. City clerk, would you do the roll call, please? Council Member Sell? Here. Council Member Papalardo? Here. Council Member Stevenson? Here. Mayor Chazé? Here. Vice Mayor Butlin? Here. Um, next would be any deletions or amendments to the agenda, and I would propose one for consideration for consensus of the council. Um, we do have a public hearing listed as agenda item one, but agenda item two is a final plat for Rivington, which I think probably will not be as time, time consuming as the hearing, and I was wondering if there would be a consensus to reverse the order and have Agenda item two be the first item we consider tonight. I'm okay with that. We're good? Okay. First up this evening, though, is a legislative update, and we welcome Sherry Simmons, Communications, Economic Development, and Government Affairs Director. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Sherry Simmons. <laughs> Economic Development Communications Government Affairs Director putting on the Government Affairs hat for this presentation. Uh, so this year, as always, it's an interesting year. I had one representative told me, um, he said, Sherry, have you ever seen the Jerry Springer show? It just was quite interesting. I went to Cynodia on uh, March 8th. Uh, so we we worked, I'm calling my presentation The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, and as we go through, I. I've grouped some of these things in those categories. We worked very closely with our state representatives, uh, State Senator Tom Wright and State Representative Stan McLean, both who we met with quite a few times, both before and during session, as well as we spoke on the phone with them very often. Um, and I can tell you they both worked extremely hard to get our concerns addressed during the session. We also work side by side with our Volusia County counterparts. Mayor Lois Peritsky of Ponce Inlet helped lead our Volusia delegation in January. Our vice mayor was a big part of that as well. Uh, this, by bringing together a united voice, it helps amplify our messages and maximized our influence on things that we needed to get accomplished. Our city manager was asked to lead the uh, Volusia League of Cities efforts regarding the Live Local Act this year, and um, in a lot of cases, they asked him to represent them as well as DeBarry when we went up there to talk about Live Local. He headed up the League's Advocacy Committee subcommittee on Live Local. So this year, there's, I've heard different numbers, but I've seen 1,732 bills filed. That, believe it or not, is a low number. Of that number, 325 passed. So you could see a lot of work in filing them, but not a lot were passed. Um, a lot of these bills, and I'd, I'd like you all to, uh, as we go through this, you'll see a lot of these bills reflect a continuing degradation of home rule. The impact to local governments to implement some of these bills is significant, either by reducing revenue collected or forcing municipalities to make costly business practice changes, such as increasing staff to, to uh, get to the new processing times, writing impact statements, or creating new processes completely. As we move through the presentation, what I just said is hopefully will be clearer. So while at first glance some of these changes may seem positive, we're all citizens, it may be like seem positive as a citizen perspective, these laws are basically a tax shift as governments are forced to do more with revenues at the current 
at current tax rates will be statutorily um, reduced. So another viewpoint is cities only have four taxing mechanisms, ad valorem municipal utilities, which we don't have, uh, municipal communications tax, and the business tax receipt. Every single mechanism was tie, uh, targeted in these filed bills for deep reduction or elimination this year. There were quite a few bills that uh, look to eliminate local voices, like the Live Local bill passed last year by requiring development projects to be automatically approved, never coming to council, never being heard, uh, residents not getting a chance to hear that, uh, as once they once they have met setbacks and compliance with land development codes. So again, a degradation of home rule. So as for the good, uh, first, uh, the budget includes another 500,000 for DeBarry for Glen Abbey's Summer Haven stormwater improvements. This brings the total appropriated for this project to 1.5 million. Uh, only 5%, excuse me, only 55% of projects that are submitted actually get into the budget. DeBarry projects always get into the budget. We have only been vetoed once, and so hopefully we're hoping the governor has lost his red pen this year when it comes to this appropriation, and uh, we, will, we will get this appropriation. Another positive bill, the Alternative mobility funding. Once again, DeBerry is on the forefront. We already passed mobility fee uh, uh, funding mechanism several years ago. This bill aims to streamline current mobility plans and fee laws. The bill specifies when both a city and a county charge a fee for transportation impacts of new development, only the local government issuing the building permit may charge for the transportation impacts. So I know. That's probably a good bill. <laughs> um, so that's going to be good news because typically the impacts fees go to the county and then the county can use them while in certain districts, a lot of times they're not used in DeBarry, they're used somewhere else. So this will keep the money in our district. The uh, increase to homestead tax exemption, that failed. That would have raised the, increased the exemption from 50,000 to 75,000. Uh, why is that good? Because while it gives a little bit of relief, anywhere 20 to 50 to 70 dollars, I think, for some homeowners who have uh, larger or high value properties, the city would lose $400,000, I think, yeah, at least $400,000. Um, the next one, the BTR, or business tax, uh, well, well, we're, they call it the local business taxes. We call it a business tax receipt. That's a $40 charge annually to businesses. But more than that, what it does is it gives us contact with the businesses. It lets us know when a business comes in where they are. Are they operating in the right zone? Are they, are they, oper are they a business that we allow? Without that contact, a business can come in and out. They may be operating dangerously next to another business. We, we would have no way to know. So this is the first step in doing inspections and doing all kinds of uh, contact with the businesses. So this, this failed. We worked um, with Stan McLean on this, and after I think it was right after our meeting with him, he actually changed it to keep the business tax but freeze the revenue from it. For us, because the revenue was small, we felt that was acceptable, but ended up the whole bill uh, failing. Another failure uh, was sovereign immunity increases that's aimed to revise the liability limits for tort claims against government entities. The bill this year was looking to double those, um, those caps and that would basically double our insurance rate. So as I said earlier, more costly to a city if some of these have passed. And finally, uh, supermajority on millage increases also failed. So now we get to some of the bad. This bill, and, and the bad, these are depending on what city you are. So this bill, we look at as bad, but other cities, uh, Deltona and DeLand would be, this is positive. Uh, some of our resident, let me get to that. Uh, this would have restricted a municipality from um, charging extraterritorial surcharges for water and sewer. So in DeBarry, almost all our residents get their, their water from Volusia County, but a small portion get it from Deltona, and Deltona charges more, I think it's at least a 25% surcharge on their bills. So this bill would have prevented 
Deltona from making that charge. It also would have prevented the cities from transferring money from that fund into their general fund. And I know DeLand, for instance, transfers 2.5 million, they said, into their general fund. So this would, if this would keep the money in the fund for municipal water. Both those bills failed. The other one, um, this passed unauthorized public camping or sleeping on public property. Again, DeBarry is in the forefront. We, we did a, we did a um, prohibition on camping on public property a uh, couple, couple years ago. The reason I have this in, in bad is because should we be forced to establish public camping in our city, public sleeping, there, the levels to establish that is very high. We'd have to have minimum sanitation levels, including access to health services. We'd have to have uh, on-site security at all times. Um, and the designated area has to be, it cannot adversely affect residential or commercial property. So there would be a big cost involved in establishing these sites, which there was another bill that would allow counties to force cities to adopt public camping um, areas. The governor, um, he signed that bill today, actually, so this has passed. Now we'll get to my final uh, section. Uh, while the, the homestead tax increase failed, they did pass uh, CPI increase to homestead tax exemption. So each year, should this pass, this will be a referendum in November, each year the exemption would go up depending on what the, uh, I'm sorry, consumer price index percentage is. After five years, it's estimated the impact to cities will be over $1 billion. So cities are gonna need to look to make up that revenue. Also what passed, Last year, they passed a bill that had uh, any ordinance other than comprehensive plan amendments or land development regulations that we wanted to pass, we would have to get a business impact statement. That means we'd have to have uh, a staff person writing that. We'd have to go to a chamber, get there. So again, more costs, more processes. This year, I guess they decided to include every ordinance. So this year, if when we're doing comprehensive plan amendments and land development regulations, those are gonna be business impact statements. And finally, well not finally, I'm sorry, uh, permitting, a lot of changes. Basically cut in half permitting. So when we look at costs to the city, we might, um, I don't wanna preempt the city manager, but we, we might need to look at expanding our permitting base because we have to turn around permits in a very, very quick time. It goes from 120 days to 30 days in some cases and 60 days in other cases. Most interestingly, it will require a local government to determine if a building application is uh, sufficient within 10, uh, excuse me, within five, I apologize, within five business days. We have to make sure it's complete. So five business days, let me be clear. Believe it or not, that is a, that's better than what it was filed as. It was filed as three calendar days. So if someone came in at 5.30 on a Friday evening, excuse me, 4.30 on a Friday evening before a three-day holiday, we would have to have someone work over the weekend to, make, to look at this application and make sure it was complete or incomplete and reach out to the developer because on Monday, it would be which is a holiday, it would be deemed complete. So now this is a five day, it gives us a little more time, but again, it cuts in half the time that is, it's normally done. And there was a lot more to that bill. I don't want to um, delay you uh, further on that, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Vice Mayor, you asked about the vacation rental. So that bill maintains the current presumption on local governments from adopting zoning ordinance specific to short-term rentals, as well as regulating the duration of stays. It does require a local registration program. Uh, well, excuse me, it's a statewide process for the local registration of vacation rentals. So we don't have a say in it. It's the state that has a say in it, but it does establish um, there's gonna be processes that have to be established. And now uh, everyone's favorite, the Live Local Act. Let me say, uh, our, again, once again, our state reps really worked hard and closely with us. Senator Wright arranged meetings with other senators, phone calls. We had one point it was almost weekly phone calls and meetings. Uh, 
with uh, some of the bureaucracies and more. So he was working really hard to hear our voices and make and try to get a solution. Whoop. Did, oh, okay. <laughs> Let me get through there. Um, oh, it doesn't. It, that's fine. So as I mentioned, it started out good, then reverted back. It started out exempting industrial property, which would have been huge from the Live Local Act, but it went back and then it actually added in more restrictions, including preempting a city from requiring parking minimums uh, if a Live Local project is within a, a TOD. It did allow the city to reduce the height of a project as if it's adjacent to a residential area uh, up to three stories. But as I mentioned, um, earlier, we, we had quite a few meetings with Stan McLean, and he worked very, very closely with DeBerry and other cities on how the Live Local Act impacts us. As chair of Ways and Means, he had oversight over the tax package. Well, he called, he called us last week. We spoke to him a couple of times. He updated us as to some changes in the tax code that can provide us some relief. I'm going to turn this over to our city manager for uh, for further discussion because, as you know, tax code and tax relief is his bailiwick, and he can certainly speak about it better than me. Okay, he needs this. Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, just a just a refresher um, on the Live Local Act. The legislature passed the Live Local Act effective July 1, 2023. Um, many people in the audience today may not uh, realize what the Live Local Act is, um, but it does allow affordable housing apartments to be built on commercial, industrial, and mixed-use property. Um, if 40% of the units are affordable, um, no council approval is needed. It, it requires only a city manager approval um, if 40% of the units are affordable. Um, it does allow for maximum density, and that means in DeBerry, anybody who wants to build an apartment on a commercial property has, a, has the availability to build 32 units an acre. Um, and allows for 75% property tax exemption on affordable units. Um, and as you know, Integra 289, as we discussed a meeting or two ago, has filed for the 75% property tax exemption for 2024. And if you want to know more, about the Live Local Act. You can read it on our DeBerry.org, our website there. You can read the bill. We also did a, a community uh, presentation on November the 7th. You can, that, that is taped and you can watch it and learn more about the um, uh, Live Local Act. So when the session started, um, uh, it was no revision in the Live Local Act, no way. Um, but through our advocacy uh, Volusia League of Cities and other organizations, we got a revision bill. And here's some of the highlights of the changes, as, as, as Sherry talked about. Um, in there is the TOD areas, the Live Local Project will be required to be mixed use in TOD areas, which is important for us. Um, it also reduced the parking for Live Local Projects in TOD areas because they assumed the mass transit, um, most people wouldn't have cars, et cetera, et cetera, or less number of cars. Um, they, did, they did add the common areas to allow uh, allowable tax exemption calculation. So when an affordable unit is deemed to be affordable and it's eligible for tax exemption, all the common areas that are associated with that affordable unit is also now tax exempt. Um, so for example, if you got 40, uh, 40 units or 40% of the units of an apartment complex that, is a, a that qualifies for tax exemption, then theoretically 40% of all the common areas are also gonna be tax exempt. Um, it also grants the property appraiser a little more authority to verify compliance, not enough to, that we prefer. Um, and so, uh, but it did, we, it did provide that. And, and, and kudos to Senator Wright uh, at the very beginning. Uh, he had meetings with the Florida Housing Coalition that he coordinated with city managers. Um, we met with uh, uh, Senator uh, Catalude, uh, who's a, a co-sponsor of the Live Local Act. Um, we met with the staff on, and, our, and our lobbyists met with the staff with uh, uh, Senator Pasadomo. And so we got a lot of our uh, ideas and thoughts, um, uh, at least voiced our, uh, had an opportunity to voice all our opinions. So uh, as you recall, the city has, has taken action. Um, we city passed on first reading ordinance 0624 at the last meeting. The second reading will be held on April the 3rd, 2024. Um, as Senator Wright and, and so, so calmly put it, it's, it's really all, any, all the cities need to fend for itself on the Live Local Act. Uh, 
Uh, so there are three primary areas of focus on our, in our live local and our land development code. Um, in our land development codes, it prevents live local projects on any com commercial, industrial, mixed uses properties within planned unit developments. Um, so the areas in front of um, uh, Glen Abbey, the areas in front of DeBerry Golf and Country Club, and some of our other PUDs, planned unit developments, um, even though they might have commercial, industrial, mixed uses in them, um, uh, they will not be uh, live local projects on those. Remember, live local projects, if they meet the 40% uh, affordable housing uh, units that are affordable, do not have to come in front of council, and they do not require rezoning. Uh, they can they can simply build on those properties with uh, staff approval. Um, we also did uh, require all live local projects be mixed use uh, with the 65-35% ratio. And then we established the audit authority and procedures to verify compliance, which, um, in my opinion, the Live Local Act falls well short of what it needs to, to be. But last week we got a, a little surprise and uh, Senator McLean, uh, head of the Ways and Means Committee, um, and uh, you typically the, the tax package for the legislature happens the last week uh, in, um, in the session. Um, and a lot of his comments, obviously there were some revenue estimates that uh, the original Live Local Act would have about a $400 million revenue impact on local government. Well, that's been revised up to about $800 million in revenue impact. And so I think that would kind of prompted that they didn't realize how much of a revenue impact was going to be on local government uh, because of the tax exemptions. Um, and so House Bill 7073, uh, which uh, has passed, uh, goes to the governor for signing, so it's not actually approved yet. But it provides an opt-out option for the tax exemption provisions if a county has sufficient affordable housing uh, based upon the Schimberg Center of Housing Studies annual report. Um, it doesn't stop live local projects. It stops the, the tax exemption, um, which, which may slow it down a little bit. And so you see the language in the bill. A taxing authority uh, must make a finding in an ordinance or resolution that mostly recently published Schimberg Center for Housing Studies annual report pursuant to Chapter 420, 6075, identifies that a county that is part of the, uh, the jurisdiction of the taxing authority is within a metropolitan statistical area or region where the number of affordable and available units in the metropolitan statistical area and region is greater than the number of renter households in the metropolitan statistical area or region for the category entitled zero to 120% annual median income. That's a lot. Um, but basically, um, if, if you have um, more affordable housing, you qualify, um, your taxing authority uh, may pass an ordinance to uh, prevent any tax exemption. Uh, it could be a city, or I believe it could be a county as well. So we, we pulled up the Schimberg Center for the Housing Studies annual report. We thought, wow, this is going to be great. Uh, there's still some issues. Um, this is the Appendix 4 from the Schimberg Center for Public Housing. Unfortunately, the MSA is combined in this report, and it's really the only situation in, of all the counties that we're combined with Palm Coast or Flagler County for some reason, uh, MSA. And between us both, there's only 357 unit deficit as far as affordable housing, which could be in the margin of error. And, and, uh, um, and so we are... I've been in contact this last week with the Florida Housing Coalition and some other folks, uh, the county as well, um, to, to see if we can work on, if we can get the statistics to split Volusia County MSA out of the Flagler MSA um, so that we can determine whether or not Volusia County is, has more affordable housing. So if that 357, negative 357 becomes positive um, and then we have the ability to pass an ordinance or a resolution to prevent the tax exemption, either in our town or the county can do that as well. And so um, I've communicated that with the county, with the county manager um, and uh, the uh, growth management director as well. Uh, we are working together and hopefully we can work together to get that clarification. In, if indeed Volusia County, in, in my opinion, knowing Flagler County well, um, I believe that if we separate Flagler County out, that this number will turn positive and that uh, we can, um, even though we'll have to uh, live with the Live Local Act and where they can build apartments, uh, the tax exemption 
uh, may go away uh, if we pass an or, uh, or ordinance and a resolution. That will take the, the tax burden off our residents and uh, puts it back on to the developer. And so we're working through this. Uh, I, didn't, I, I do have the, the Schimberg report if you want it. It's uh, several hundred pages long. Um, and, uh, but I just provided you the appendix which uh, applies to this particular law. So even though it, it, it's good and if it gets signed by the governor, we'll still have some detailed work to work with the Florida Housing Coalition and the Schimberg Center for Housing Studies uh, to see if we can separate uh, this line item so that we can make a, a definitive uh, decision on whether or not uh, we have the adequate affordable housing or not and whether or not they will be subject to tax exemption or not. So stay tuned, um, but that's the, that's the actual update on Live Local uh, as of today. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll move forward. So again, kudos to um, Representative Stan McLean. Uh, he worked really hard, uh, particularly with the, the revenue impacts um, to try to you know, soften the blow for uh, our local governments. And so they did a great job in doing this. And so uh, Florida Housing Coalition has done a summary on this particular bill. And so we hope the governor will sign it and give at least the communities that are already have affordable housing not have to provide the tax exemption. I'll turn it back over to Sherry to finish up. Well, uh, that is pretty much it. But just to remind you that the Live Local, where it's 100, it's really not, a, as we have shown in past presentations, it's not affordable. Uh, the fact that Integra came, is coming in and asking for the tax it, uh, exemption shows that it's market rate. So it, don't, I don't want folks to think that we're, we're against affordable housing. We certainly are not. This is not affordable housing. Thank you very much, Sherry and uh, City Manager Carmen, for that update. I would like uh, one clarification, perhaps, from one of you, maybe the City Manager. Just because we have a lot of Glen Abbey residents here, and you did point out that if the budget is passed without a line strike, we are getting 500,000. You said for Glen Abbey stormwater repairs. What I, this is an ongoing project that I think for clarity of those in the audience, we ought to at least characterize. These are existing corrugated pipes that were put in how many decades ago oh, and have deteriorated. So this is a replacement to infrastructure put in by the county, which is way past its life. And we are now having to fix. And that is what it is. It's not a stormwater issue that's been unaddressed somewhere in Glen Abbey, um, which I thought that clarification would be useful. City Manager, do you want to yeah, ex the, expand a little bit? Well, and we'll cover a little bit later in the agenda item, but the county uh, approved the, the Swallows PUD in 1972 and, and amended in 78. Um, they allowed the, the subdivision to be built, the stormwater system to be built with corrugated metal pipe. Um, and corrugated metal pipe has a 25 to 30 year life before it starts to rust out. Uh, when we came, the council and I came on board in 2019, we were just learning about this particular issue that uh, um, we had a lot of collapsing pipes in, in Glen Abbey that we were fixing. Um, it, it was a, a five to $10 million um, uh, exposure that we had to fix um, and so we've been going to the legislature the last two or three years I think year one we got 300,000 yeah. year three I think 70 750,000 and this year 500,000 to help us um, either line those particular pipes or replace them um, so that uh, ultimately in, in Glen Abbey and Summerhaven um, we will have a full functioning working stormwater system uh, that it's completely up to date that will last for the next uh, 25 or 30 years. And, and of course, Mayor, we match, we're matching. Yes, that. we match, yeah. we match that. It's not free without any input from us. Thank you both for that clarification. Um, unless there's any further questions for the city manager, Sherry, I appreciate the update. We will move on to new business the applicant, H.R. Rivington LLC, is seeking final plat approval for Rivington Phase 4, which consi will consist of 202 lots for townhomes. And uh, city staff, would you provide us the information on this item? <clears throat> Certainly. Stephen Bapp, Growth Management Director. <clears throat> um, this is the final plat for Rivington Phase 4. Um, 
Project location is indicated on the aerial photograph, south of Lake Conomac, south of Fort Florida Road. Um, this has already had its preliminary plat and all its other documents. This is only the uh, final phase, which is the registration and the lot layout. <clears throat> um, timeline associated, um, as many of you know, the Rivington MPUD was first adopted in 2018. Um, this portion, which is a 30-acre portion, was annexed into the PUD in uh, 2021. And after that point, we did a conditionally approval, recommended conditional approval of the preliminary plat construction plans for this um, back shortly after my arrival in July of 2022. The city manager issued his development order so they could proceed with um, groundwork on the project. And then in 2023, uh, the Development Review Committee reviewed and recommended approval to the City Council for the uh, final plat phase. Finding of facts, all requirements to the City's Land Development Code and Florida statutes have been addressed. The City Surveyor um, has, in conformity with Chapter 177 of the Florida Statutes, has reviewed the final plat and the City Attorney has conducted his legal review of the final plat and title of opinion. On October, excuse me, December 5th of last year, 2023, the DRC reviewed and recommended approval to the City Council for the final plat, contingent on addressing several outstanding issues, and to date, these uh, staff comments have since been addressed. Uh, based on the finding of facts of the final plat, it's recommended the City Council approve the final plat for Rivington Phase 4, and if approved, um, the plat will be recorded with the Volusia County Clerk of Courts along with other supporting documentation and the lots will be available for sale to people who want to buy them. Thank you. Right. City Clerk, do we have any public participation on this item? No, ma'am, we do not. Uh, Council Member Sell, questions or comments? No questions. Council Member Papillardo? No questions. Council Member Stevenson? No questions. Vice Mayor Butlin? No questions. And I have no questions as well. As you point out, this is a final plat. We've been through the preliminary plat and worked through the various phases of this over the last number of years. So if there's no further discussion, I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the final is plat your, for Rivington Phase 4. Is your mic on? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'll make a motion to approve the final plat for Rivington Phase 4 is subject to the items listed on the agenda. The Second. conditions, rather. Second. Second. Vice Mayor Butlin? Yes. Councilmember Papillardo? Yes. Councilmember Sell? Yes. Councilmember Stevenson? Yes. And I am a yes. So the plat is approved. Then we will move on to our public hearing. Staff is requesting the City Council approve the first reading of Ordinance Number 07. 2024 amending the Swallows planned unit development to add certain permitted uses to the development agreement and development standards herein therein city attorney would you read ordinance number 07 2024 ordinance number 07-2024, an ordinance of the City of DeBerry, Florida, approving a major amendment to the Glen Abbey Plan Unit Development, aka Swallows PUD, governing an approximately 32.21 more or less acres of land located on the north side of East High Banks Road, east of U.S. Highway 1792, with a Volusia County property tax identification number of 8027000000062 and 8026000065 and owned by Kimiya uh, LLC amending the plan unit development agreement to permit certain additional specified uses on the property and updating the conceptual development plan to show the plan development of the property providing for severability recording and an effective date thank you this is a quasi-judicial hearing, and I will outline the order of business, which you also see printed in front of you up on the screen. First, we will outline the process, which I am doing now. The second thing to happen is we will swear in witnesses. So if you have turned in 
a yellow speaker card before the beginning of the meeting and will be speaking during public comment. You need to stand up and be sworn in as a group. The city clerk will do this next after I finish the instructions. Following that, there will be dis disclosure of ex parte communications by the city council. I will poll each member of the council to find out if they have had conversations on the side before this hearing, which as I have explained to some of you in person before the meeting, is sort of like a court hearing. Um, did they speak to anybody? And if they did, they will give the nature of their discussion. Then we will have the presentation by the city staff. The city staff has up to 10 minutes to describe the proposal. Following that, the applicant, the one asking for this, will have up to 15 minutes to speak to the proposal. And any portion of that 15 minutes could be reserved for rebuttal. So if the applicant chooses to speak for five minutes. There is an additional 10 minutes which could be given them later in the, in the process uh, to speak to concerns that may have been raised. Following the applicant's case, then I will have public participation, three minutes per individuals um, and any groups and no group notified me that they have formed so there won't be a six minutes per group. Um, I will read your name, you come up to the podium, you state your name and address for the record, and then you make your comments. You have three minutes for your comments. When all of the public participation is concluded, the applicant will have 10 minutes for rebuttal, plus any time reserved from the case before the, the public participation. And then after all of that is done, the council will have deliberation and questions among them, and they will, we, I will go down the, the dais and ask questions and comments. They may be directed at staff. They may be directed at the applicant. They may uh, reiterate perhaps a, a point somebody from the public made and ask for further clarification. Whatever the council would like to do is, is what will happen at that point. And then the city council will take action. Now those actions, do we have the screens on what our charge is? Our responsibilities are defined by uh, law and resolutions here in the city. So we have to determine whether to approve or deny an application considering evidence that relates to the applicable criteria for relief as set out. We can only consider such evidence as will establish a substantial basis of fact from which facts and issues can be reasonably inferred. Hypothetical, speculative, fearful, or emotion-based generalizations or statements that do not address the relevant issues are not generally not sufficient to constitute evidence to support the City Council's decision. In making its determination, the City Council may not rely on mere opinion unless that opinion is offered by someone with technical expertise in regard to the relevant subject matter, an ex subject matter expert. Evidence that is vague or speculative or that is otherwise irrelevant to the matter being determined may not be used to support the City Council's determination. Rather, the City Council must base its decision on evidence that is relevant to the matter at hand, that is substantial, and that is reliable and credible. So at that point, there will be a council vote, um, a motion, and then a council vote on the motion, and the matter will be decided. So I would welcome city staff uh, to the po Oh, I'm sorry. Next, we will swear in witnesses. Anyone who has submitted a card who may speak, and I will say your name, and if your question's been answered and you decline to speak, just give me the sign and I will move on to the next person. But if you may speak, please be sworn in. Okay. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, we have William Taylor, are you standing? We have Karen Ritter, are you standing to be sworn in? Jill Topher and John Beverly, okay? Do we have four now? Is John Beverly, 
You would need to stand and be sworn in, sir, if you're going to speak. So you, she will swear you in now. Can you raise your right hand. Can you raise your? Okay. Raise your right hand. Would you, you raise need to your right swear hand? Swear to tell the truth. She's going to May swear you in. I swear the testimony or statements you're about to give are the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, and next we will have disclosure of ex parte communications by the City Council. Council Member Sell, have you had any ex parte communications? No communications. Council Member Papillardo. No, but I did attend the community meeting March 11th, and afterwards I exchanged pleasantries with staff and Mr. Watts. Thank you. And Council Member Stevenson? No ex parte communications. Vice Mayor Butlin? I had some communication with some residents before the meeting. I did not attend the meeting, but just for clarification purposes. Thank you, and I have no, no ex parte di discussion either, although I did receive, and I believe other council members did receive, an email from someone at 111 Pineside Drive who cannot be here this evening and asked that that email be con considered as part of the public input. You each have had that email um, because I saw all of you copied, and so I did send that person a note saying thank you for your email everyone has it and that was the extent of my communication so now we will move to the presentation by city staff thank you very much Stephen Bapp growth management director tonight we have a request for the approval of a major amendment to the swallows and PUD to permit townhomes and the development standards therein. Project location. The project location is located east of 1792 and north of High Banks Road. It's indicated on the map, the aerial photograph, and is outlined in the uh, dark teal as you see on the board. Um, this was spoke to um, earlier by the city manager. Um, but the timeline, uh, on 9 18, 1972, the Volusia County approved the change of zoning for the Swallows PUD. It adopted the community development plan for the PUD, and which included roughly 82 acres for 180 condominium units. Go forward to 1978, Volusia County approved the amendments changing permitted uses of condominiums to apartments with up to 526 units permitted. Since this resolution to the present day, the PUD has been amended frequently throughout subsequent decades, resulting in a development pattern deviating from the originally adopted community development plan. Timeline continued and timeline specific to this application. In April of 2023, the applicant submits a, an application for, over, for the overall development plan. The DRC reviewed and continued the item. In 2023, the applicant then submitted a major PUD amendment um, to the DRC. The DRC on 17th of October heard the item and continued the item and provided ap um, the applicant with appropriate staff comments. In January of 2024, the DRC reviewed and recommended approval of the item as the applicant had addressed the staff comments they had. On March 11th, 2024, the applicant hosts a community meeting attended by city staff members, including myself, to obtain feedback from nearby residents. Now, what is the original plan for the Swallows MPUD? It is a little bit dark in a uh, um, diagram, but the circled area is the area which is just um, east of 1792 and north of High Banks Road. You can see No Name Lake in the center of the circled red area with apartment complexes on the north and south side of the lake. This was the originally adopted plan. <clears throat> the new overall plan excuse me, the proposed overall site plan for today's applica application now addresses the area south of No Name Lake. It'll have 126 townhomes configured into 25-foot lots 
with some um, townhomes having four units, some five, and some six, as illustrated on the plan. It'll have supporting infrastructure to circulate traffic, and it will not be built on any or impact any existing wetlands. Um, it'll also have on-site stormwater to facilitate and maintain the stormwater on site. The amended language itself in the um, mass in the in the PUD, it'll amend the permitted uses to add townhomes. It'll amend the development standards for multifamily dwellings to standards more suitable with developments for townhomes, including lot dimensions, setbacks, and minimal parking requirements. And it'll create a new land uh, development agreement for the project or an amendment as required by our land development code. Since this came to the DRC and since the 11th of March, the applicant has proposed to make the following changes based on input received from the general public at a community meeting. Item one, construction of a six foot fence along the property line adjacent to residential structures in addition to the proposed landscaping buffer and perimeter building setbacks. Also, the applicant has removed the RV boat storage area and removed that as a use associated with this project and the area proposed earlier would be left as green space. In the short time available, I did not make a colored graphic, but this is a, a um, hand-drawn note in, provided by the applicant and this the exhibit will be updated at second reading. It has the added fence on the north and east of the project, and it has a note to delete the RV boat storage area um, used as an open space in consideration for um, transfer to the city at a later time. Now, we had some notes about, well, what is the separation between my house and these townhomes? Um, this is a this is an aerial photograph of the existing townhomes on Pineside Drive. Excuse me, existing homes on Pineside Drive and Adelaide Street. What's superimposed there in the black and white is the proposed townhome development, with directional arrows between the distances. Now, for example, 111 North Pineside Drive. That is the top um, left yellow arrow should not read 40, should actually read 44. But there is a measure distance which we measure from um, the GIS system which provides accurately measured um, distances down to like one inch. The distance between that house and the proposed fence line or property fence would be 14 feet. There would be a 20 foot project vegetative buffer and then the townhome would be required to be set back from that buffer by a minimum of 10 feet, giving a total of 44 feet. 114 Pineside Drive would have a separation distance of 95 point, excuse me, 59.5 feet, with 29.5 to the um, project fence, a 20 foot um, vegetative project buffer, and a 10 foot um, townhome setback. Working away counterclockwise, you hit three, excuse me, 236, Adelaide Street would have a, actually a 57 foot, that save did not change, but 57 foot separation as the project, uh, the home to the project fence would be 27 feet, the project buffer would be 20, and the townhome setback would be 10. 327 Adelaide Street would have a 70 foot separation. The distance to the project fence would be 16 feet, Dis the project buffer would be 20, it would have a 24 foot roadway, which is part of the cir traffic circulation, and then the townhome setback of 10 feet, adding up to um, a total of 70 feet. So those are the separations between this townhome development and the nearest um, single family residence existing in the Glen Abbey subdivision. There were some questions on natural resources, capital improvement, transportation impact analysis, et cetera. Um, if this plan is if the use is approved, which we're addressing tonight, um, the plant project would move forward into a, to a uh, detailed engineering phase. 
And in the detailed engineering phase, there would be um, numbers granted, which would generate the, uh, and, and review the tree protection, the tree replacement requirements, the capital improvement compliance, future land use compliance, TIA, and school um, concurrencies. Based on the finding of facts, the applicant proposes to amend the PUD to permit townhomes, the corresponding development standards, and required development language to the plan. The proposed use is consistent with the City of Bear Comp Plan and will be further evaluated in the subsequent phases. Thus, staff recommends City Council approve the first reading of Ordinance 7 to allow the Swallows PUD. And if approved on first reading tonight, the staff will schedule a second hearing of the ordinance. City Manager, you have 45 seconds if you wanted to add something. No, Mayor, I'll, I'll, just, push, can, I'll just push to, uh, to discussion. When we get to discussion, you can have additional information. Yeah. Thank you, and then I would invite the applicant to the podium, name and address for the record, and who you represent. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, members of the council, for the record, Mark Watts with the law firm of Cobb Cole. Uh, 231 North Woodland Boulevard, Deland. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you this evening. Um, appreciate all the time and effort that staff has put into reviewing our application and, and uh, the recommendations that they've given us along the way. Um, I, I think they've given you a very uh, concise and accurate uh, overall summary. Uh, I've got a few more things I wanted to just uh, add to detail some of the um, features of the, of the uh, application in front of you this evening. Um, <clears throat> This property's got a, obviously a lot of history. Um, you know, the, the original PD for the Swallows development was approved in 1972. I joked at the neighborhood meeting last week that was before I was born, so a re really long time ago. Um, but uh, yeah, approved in 1972. The, the amendment with respect to this particular property to add the existing use of multifamily was approved in 1978. Um, this and the commercial piece that, that um, was referenced earlier this evening um, at the entrance to Glen Abbey are really kind of the last remaining parts of the Glen Abbey uh, planned unit development that um, have not been uh, developed at this point in time. So the overall site, uh, the overall um, project that our property that our client Kamaya owns um, is 32 acres. Um, we'll look at that in a, in a minute. A good portion of that is in the lake. Um, and we'll, I'll, I'll touch on a couple things with regard to that. Um, and it's, as I noted, been part of the Swallows or the Glen Abbey PUD since uh, the, the 1970s. Um, what we're proposing to do is um, amend the PUD to add um, the use of townhomes as a permitted principal use because right now multifamily is the only uh, permitted principal use that's associated with this portion of the property. Um, and then we had rec uh, proposed to have a, a RV and storage area on some of the kind of leftover property. Um, got a lot of comments from that, a lot of comments about, you know, that may be better suited for green space adjacent to high banks um, or even for improvement as a, you know, city park in that area at some point in time. Um, and so we took that into account. Um, after the community meeting, we met back up with our client. We've removed that part from our application. I've got an updated site plan uh, that I'll show you here in just a minute. Um, that has a couple of changes on it, um, but we thought that was a reasonable uh, change based on the input we received. Um, you've got a, a couple of examples of architecture. Um, you know, um, these are samples that were provided by uh, Kamaya is a, um, a related company to Park Square Homes. Um, these are some of their townhome renderings on the bottom. The one on top is actually a picture of one of their developments. Um, I, I thought it was a rendering when I first looked at it, but um, they clarified to me that's an actual photo of one of their completed projects down in Orlando, and that's the type of unit uh, that they would be looking at constructing um, in DeBerry as well. Um, I won't go into this into too much detail, but you know, right now, um, 526 apartments is the maximum number in all of, uh, you know, Glen Abbey. Obviously, this is not all of the property that was included in that footprint under the original uh, development plan. We've looked at it just based on the 15.5 acres of kind of area that's within our, de up our developable portion of this property. That would equate to somewhere between 210 to 217 apartment units that would be the current um, you know, uh, development entitlement associated with the property if you build apartments instead of townhomes. So we're looking to move away from that. In fact, I mentioned to uh, the city manager and uh, uh, planning director that, you know, if we want to also just eliminate multifamily as a use, we're willing to do that as well um, so that you are guaranteed that townhomes is the use that you'd be uh, getting in this uh, as a result of the application. Um, so 
That's the overall footprint of the property uh, that our client owns. As you can see, a lot of that is in No Name Lake and in some of the areas that, that go up, um, you know, along um, uh, um, 1792. Um, you, interestingly, if you look back at the original plans from uh, the 1978 plan, um, the little peninsula that sticks into No Name Lake was actually shown with apartments on it as well. Um, we know that there's floodplain issues. There's a lot of issues that would prevent that from happening. But one of the things that we'd be happy to consider uh, working with the city on moving forward, particularly in the subdivision process, would be um, dedication of either conservation easements over the remaining, all the portions that are in yellow here, or even transferring those to the city if that was the city's desire so that you have more control over that um, area uh, of the lake. Um, this is you know, kind of the area that we're, we're highlighting. As you can see, if you look at the, the plan on the bottom with the apartment layouts, we're really just talking about the, the kind of bottom right-hand side, side of that being where the development would be concentrated. The rest of it would be open space and, and green space that would be retained. Um, zooming in on the site, um, you have basically you know, roads, buffers, uh, green space. We preserve the wetland that's in the center of the site. We've tried to make that the, the location where the amenity for the uh, community would be located as well. So you've got a nice natural uh, look and feel in that area. Um, after the community meeting, we, we, you've got in your materials my memorandum summarizing kind of the topics that were discussed. They were you know, kind of wide ranging and I'll touch on a few of the others, but some of the ones that, that we could do something about um, readily um, were eliminating, if you see the green arrow on the left, that was the area that was proposed as an RV and, and boat storage area for residents. We've eliminated that. One of the comments that also came up at the community meeting was having that use there would have resulted in more driveways coming onto high banks. So that would also eliminate the additional driveways coming onto high banks and you'd only have the two um, that are shown here on the site which align with the streets to the south as well. Um, in addition, um, the single family residents on, on Pineside and Adelaide um, had asked um, for you know, consideration of additional buffering, installation of a fence. Um, so we've added that as a requirement to the plan and would stipulate uh, that that would be a condition um, that we would ask you to include in any motion to approve. Um, some of the other specific things we heard, we, we know um, stormwater, anytime I come to DeBerry, I know we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about stormwater. Um, we know that um, there's a history of flooding. You talked about the, the, the um, you know, issues in Glen Abbey. Um, we're well aware of those. Uh, they were also brought up at our community meeting. Um, we're not seeking any kind of relief from the city's requirements or any other requirements with regard to stormwater design. We're just not yet at that point yet in the overall application process. So that engineering exercise, we may end up you know, losing a few units here and there depending on what that engineering requires. Um, but that would be the step uh, that would come during your subdivision review after we've addressed whether or not the use is permissible for, for townhomes in lieu of multifamily. Um, same thing with roads and, and intersection improvements. We've had preliminary discussions with um, your staff and the city manager. Um, we know some of the things that we may be looking at working with the city to provide as far as road improvements in the area, turn lanes, some of the intersection improvements coming into high banks, um, adding in some of the uh, sidewalks um, that um, you know can provide uh, pedestrian connectivity, you know, kind of at this main, you know, the main intersection, you know, here in, in DeBerry. So. Um, those things are also part of that you know, next step in the process, that subdivision review process. And again, not asking for any um, special treatment. We fully intend to move forward in accordance with your code. Um, finally, um, you know, one of the things that was asked a lot about was schools and school capacity. Um, and again, um, we're required here, we're, we're actually reducing the overall density that the existing zoning would allow. Um, but when we get into the, the subdivision process, we have to go back to the school system, ask them again to certify not only do they have capacity, but will they reserve that capacity for the project? And so um, at any point, you know, that answer to that traffic question, the answer to that school question, the answer to that stormwater question may result in either the project being put on hold because capacity doesn't exist or participation with the city, the county, or the school board in road improvements, school improvements, things of that nature to make sure that capacity is there. And again, that's all required by your code and we fully intend to move forward in compliance with that. So with that, I will stop and ask if anybody has any questions. That's not how our process that, works. That's true. That's so all, I always end my slides you have, that way though. Yes, so. you have, how many minutes six were, and yeah. six and a half minutes are reserved I'll reserve. and I'm going to go to public participation. 
William Taylor, would you come to the microphone and speak? You have three minutes. Your name and address for the record. My name is William Taylor. My address is 244 Adelaide Street. Is that enough? Sure. Three questions, easy. First is uh, traffic on high banks. Uh, with the, this number of units being built, or is there going to have a need to make high banks four lane, uh, three lane? How are we going to get in and out of there? Because that's a lot of traffic right now. I can take uh, 15 minutes to go, uh, 10 minutes maybe, to go half a mile because of the school zones and the uh, buses that and the traffic back up. So that's a question. What are you going to do about relieving traffic on high banks? The next one, I haven't heard a word about updating or what it's going to take for the septic system. I've heard stormwater, haven't heard a thing about septic. How, how are these numbers of people going to uh, manage taking a poop? Because I haven't heard crap, and that's what I want to know. Next thing. Thank you. I think it's funny, too. Uh, the next thing and the last thing is uh, the lady that, that lives at the very end of Adelaide Street has bear poop all over her ground, all over her house, not house, all over her uh, grass constantly. I have had bears climb my trees because my next door neighbor, and she is here, she can testify to it. She said, William, you got bears climbing your trees. So my question is, I haven't heard uh, very much about an environmental impact, but I know that those bears live there. And uh, what are you going to do with those bears? You're going to shoot them? You're going to move them to Alaska? What are you going to do about the bears that live there? Because I haven't heard squat about anything environmental impact. I'm done. Thank you, sir. Karen Ritter. Name and address for the record. Karen Ritter, 7 Springland Drive. Okay, go ahead. And I back up this property directly across from the lake. Okay. And I'm here on behalf of every resident in Spring Glen, too, which is 131 residents. We are concerned about the golf course, uh, number 12, hole 12. It's a low 12. Every time it rains, it floods. So I need to know what you're going to do about that, because if that golf course goes out, the value of our property goes down, way down. And you can testify that. So you don't want to lose a golf course. I don't want to lose a golf course. I've got Lake and Golf Front property. I'm concerned about that. I know he addressed a few things that they're going to change, which is a good thing. The um, conservative area that he's giving up from the RV boat storage area up through the one that backs up my property, I'd like to see St. John's Water Management get that instead of the city of DeBerry. That way they can regulate the water going in and out. I know they work with you guys, but I'd like to see St. John's be the holder of that. No city park in there. I don't want people in my backyard. And that's literally in my backyard. That's my big concern about that. 129 townhomes means at least 129 kids for our school system. That's going to be a big problem. You've got the project that's going down there where you tore all the trees down. You're going to put houses in there. You've got more condos and houses being built down at the intersection down there you've got you just approved one where are you gonna put all these kids that's gonna have a really big impact on DeBerry elementary school you know and I I'm glad I don't have kids in school because of that but they're my main concerns and I'd like to see them addressed thank you thank you Jill Topher did I say it right Offer. Okay. <laughs> so who cares, huh? 
So my name's Jill Toffer. I live on 109 Pineside Drive. So I'm like my um, side yard is going to back up to at least 15 new homes, um, new neighbors. So you guys addressed the fence because I did um, speak with the attorney and I'm grateful that you know my voice was heard because there is, you know, we have property that is a drainage area. So it attracts kids, it's fun, you know. But if you have over 100 new families, you would want to protect them from uh, any danger and then protect my liability because that's my property that's also wetlands there. Um, so can I ask questions? I just had you, two you, questions. You need to address the council. Oh, but the, que the questions. Well, he has rebuttal time, so I'll oh. let him see if he answers your questions. But you're... You need to address us as the council. Okay, well, that's I was just the process. If it was rental or is it owned property, like okay. are they townhouses that people own, all right, or if it's rental. Yeah. And also, I just want to know if there's going to be windows in the back of the houses, because then I'm going to have to figure that out, because I'll have, okay. you know, 18 people looking in my backyard, 18 okay. houses. That was all I wanted to ask. Thank you, John Beverly. I'm totally unaccustomed to this sort of thing, so please bear with me. Take a deep uh, breath, that's fine. Name and address uh, for the record. John this, Beverly at, what's your right address? 151 East High Thank Banks you. Road. Thank you. This proposed project is directly across the road from my house, okay. situated on the north side of High Banks. I live on the south side. Obviously, there's woods over there. but. Aside from the heavy traffic that's going to be created, already on a, an overburdened stretch of road, I object to the uh, proposed rezoning based on the traffic situation and the uh, uh, pro reduced property values for the people on the south side of the uh, of High Banks, and I'm sure I'm not the only one involved with this. At the present time, we have a tremendous amount of heavy truck traffic on East High Banks, which I've considered uh, approaching the city council about uh, restricting uh, truck traffic on that road to uh, vehicles with less than six wheels, but I guess I don't have a whole lot more to say, but I, I object to the proposed rezoning of that property as 31 acres or 32 acres. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. So I would welcome the applicant back for a rebuttal, and you have, uh, what is it, you have... 16 and a half minutes. Hopefully far Six more time than I need. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Appreciate the opportunity to come back up. Um, let, me, let me go through and address the questions you know, yes. that each speaker uh, raised first and foremost. Um, both Mr. Uh, Taylor um, and uh, Mr. Beverly addressed the question of traffic. Um, and what improvements would be done with regard to high banks. Um, we don't fully know yet um, because, again, that's part of that traffic analysis that comes as the subdivision um, process moves forward. We do know the city is working on some plans as is with regard to some turn lane improvements that would be added in there. So our expectation would be we'd be partnering with the city to um, fund or build some of those as we move forward with the overall development so that we're contributing to, you know, the improvements to the road network in the area. So I would expect intersection improvements at high banks primarily. Um, we don't know yet um, whether the volume of traffic would trigger, you know, anything like a signal or anything like that for the connections at Matanzas or Amigos. I don't think it would, but that would be something that would be part of the city's review and determination during that subdivision review process. Um, with regard to the question Mr. Taylor raised about septic, um, there's not, this would not be septic um, because of the type of development uh, proposed and, and the other regulations the city has, this would be required to extend and connect into um, the central sewer system. So um, this would be all treated with um, sewer. Um, we're aware, we've heard some comments about uh, Mr. Taylor's other comment about wildlife in the area. Um, this is really not 
um, the type of place you want to preserve as habitat. I mean, it's, it is kind of in the center of the city. Um, one of the things that I point out a lot of times when, when we have discussions like this, um, you know, with neighborhood meetings and at, at commissioner council meetings, is I think one of the things that DeBerry has done very well, that Volusia County has done very well, is we've set aside a lot of habitat. Um, we've got about 36% of the county overall that's established as conservation and habitat area, uh, most of it in connected systems. Um, so that's far kind of ahead of where a lot of urbanizing uh, counties are. Um, and I think it's been done very conscientiously to provide habitat with a play or habitat for wildlife that's displaced from urban development. And again, um, I think in this type of area adjacent to the major roadways and everything else, it's really, you know, kind of the um, uh, preservation of a 15 acre tract as habitat would not really provide functional habitat for, you know, a long period of time. Um, with regard to Ms. Ritter's um, questions, um, primarily with regard to stormwater and some of the comments about the golf course, obviously our um, burden um, as, a, as the property owner that receives some of that water is to continue receiving it. So to the extent any water flows onto that parcel um, from off-site, um, we're required to continue to allow that water to come on site. It's part of our, becomes part of our storm, stormwater management requirements to uh, continue allowing it to come on site. Uh, retain it on site and not increase the rate or volume of discharge um, off the site. And that um, calculation and those designs are reviewed by your staff, as you know, um, and by the water management district staff. So, um, you know, we fully intend to comply with that and we'll have to maintain those things. Um, I can't guarantee that, you know, a golf course is going to stay in, in business. I know that that's an important thing for the community. Um, I've been involved with a number of projects where, um, you know, you've had to deal with the conversion of that, of that land. Um, having additional residents nearby that hopefully a few of them will play golf hopefully adds to um, the business that the golf course is able to generate as well. Um, with regard to school capacity, as I mentioned before, um, we have to go through the school board's process. They've got a formula. I can't feign to explain it um, to you how they, they do their student generation rates, but um, we don't get to move forward and build unless they confirm that they have capacity. I do know they're looking at a possible K through uh, eight uh, additional school site in DeBerry now. I agree it's needed. Um, so we will, I, I have another site up in the northeastern part of the county now where uh, the, the school board has stepped in and said we don't have capacity. Um, and so we're now working with them to come up with mitigation strategies and how do we fund, you know, the additional capacity earlier. Um, so that's the type of process that you require as part of your subdivision review. Um, Ms. Topher's question as far as um, whether they'll be rented or owned. Um, they will be platted. Uh, so each individual townhome, the property would be platted. Um, I can't attest to what a individual owner may do. Um, you can't um, generally in a zoning document put a regulation in saying you can't as a property owner rent your property, um, but the, the individual units would be rented and individually um, owned. Um, so I can say that it's going to go through your subdivision process rather than being a rental community. Um, the uh, windows, the, the rear of the house would have windows, you know, uh, rear of the townhome units would have windows on, you know, as you would typically design them. But, um, you know, we've tried to provide for a layer. We've got building separation, plus we've got the, the uh, landscape buffer, um, and we added in the fence as well as part of the requests coming from the, the community meeting last week. Um, I think I hit everything. So unless okay. anybody heard something that I missed, uh, I think I've covered. I think questions. we will cover it in questions and comments yes, from the council. Okay. Council member Sell, questions and comments. A couple hundred <clears throat> questions. Mark, you had mentioned that um, it may be possible that the home, the uh, landowner might be willing to give the city some property um, for safekeeping. Hmm. Would, would there be a possibility of an area for public access so we could have a pier on No Name Lake somewhere closer to 1792 so kids could use it to fish? Well, I lost my clicker, but um, you know, I think going back to the, the look at that, it's got animation. Um, you know, our, our discussion had been, you know, the kind of the area here in yellow and then however that would be used, whether it would be for additional stormwater improvement, improvements or other, 
you know, improvements by the city, we, we would be receptive to, to whatever the city would like to do there. So um, I think that there was at least one uh, resident that spoke at the community meeting about the area that we had originally in the plan as the RV or boat storage area for the residents um, being an appropriate place for something like a pier or a dock. But again, I would defer to the city on, on that. On that green space, yes, um, no, no opportunity for like a dog park, playground, pickleball court, something provided by the developer? We have, uh, are you talking about open for the community? Yes. Um, I, I think we've, we have that constructed internally. We'd be happy to work with the city moving forward with regard to what happens on that uh, other property that we would be leaving as open space. Have any of the residents mentioned anything about putting something there other Not than just grass? I think the majority of the residents liked the idea of keeping it as green space adjacent to high banks there. That was the comment we, we heard most uh, at the community meeting. Um, or, again, we did hear at least one person say it would be nice to make it a little pocket park of some kind. Golf cart friendly sidewalks? Uh, that's what we've talked about with the with the city manager. Yes. Have we done a updated road impact, or are we going to do that? We we still have to do that. Um, we because of, of where we are in the the steps in the process, that will be the next requirement before we move into the um, uh, subdivision process. We'll have to provide that TIA. You already answered the question on rentals or home ownership. That's not something that you can control. Um, but these would be individually platted lots, so they would be um, platted units, and, and that's typically how you do um, like regular sub, uh, subdivision. So. so on the piece of property, um, it's been undeveloped for a long time. Yes. So you got scrub jays, turtles. The bear thing is actually a real problem. I really don't want to be uh, the one that says we don't care about the wildlife or the bears. Sure. Uh, has anyone ever, you know, Trap the bears and reload located them because I really hate to see a dead bear on High Banks Road no, or somebody's dog being eaten by a bear. Sure. No, I, I certainly understand that. So what we will have to do as we go through the subdivision process is um, we we have to update our environmental impact you know analysis and and do our species survey on the property. So we would have to document any protected species there, and if they are if are any are found, then we would have to go through the process to coordinate relocation of those species. Um, I'm going down the list here. We've got the wildlife, scrub jays, turtles, traffic study, road improvements. Why did it take uh, 50 plus years for this to all of a sudden pop up? Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting to see, you know, as you mature as a community, the properties that you once looked at and said, that's probably never going to be anything built there, um, that then, you know, because of the changes in the economy, changes in the availability of land, things of that nature, it becomes something that is more feasible maybe as time goes by and land becomes more scarce. And building in a place like this allows you to concentrate that growth in the center of where you already have your infrastructure and your facilities rather than spreading out and, and sprawling further out into the areas away from the center of the city. I, I think uh, as years go on, there's going to be a lot of pieces of property that didn't look like they could put a house on it. Yeah. And it's just going to get creative. Um, my other question, why, why didn't you just go with the apartments? Uh, that's just frankly what our client, our client doesn't develop apartments. Um, and so I think they just didn't have an interest in, in going down that road. Um, you know, they, they always could sell that portion of the land for, some, for that use, but um, they just felt like, you know, their market is, um, they, they're a home builder. Um, and so their intent was to build, to buy here so that they could build their communities here, one of their communities here. I don't know if anybody on the audience realizes it, but it's very unusual for a developer to come and say, oh, we want to get do it something is. smaller than it's usually larger. Right. You know, we got 50 acres. It's, it's good for 200 homes. We want to put 500 on it. You know, uh, why can't you approve that? So it is very unusual. How about the town hall meeting? Did you have to have a town hall meeting or you just felt like that was something that needed to be done? It's something I believe I, your code requires we the require. town hall meeting. So um, we do them usually whether they're required by the city or not. Um, but I, I, your code, I, I like the, the requirement there because it does result in productive change and, and conversation. And I see that after your town hall meeting, you, apps, you did actually do some. Yeah. So, uh, small changes. What about the fence? Is it going to be chain link? Is it going to be, you know, so you can't see over it? It would be required to be an opaque fence. Uh, it would meet your standards for from a landscaping uh, buffer standpoint, so it would be required to be a opaque. I don't know the material at this point in time. I think, I don't remember if your code allows wood, but it would likely be some other more durable material. Um, 
it could ultimately be a panelized system of some kind. I, I don't know that that design detail yet. Um, uh, just a couple more questions. Um, as it pertains to the country club, not long ago, maybe last year, we did pass uh, an ordinance where if the country club was to go in the red and decide that they wanted to sell to a developer, they would first have to come to us and we would have the dibs on buying the piece of property and just making it a passive park. Yes. So worst case scenario, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that that golf course, if it did ever, and I don't want to ever see it go under, would turn into a park. I know if I bought a house on whole on the green, 18th green, and I bought it at a premium, I really expect it to be that way um, for, yeah. for the in perpetuity forever. Council Member Sell, I think the city manager would like to clarify what we did and what has been considered, and they're two different. You've sort of meshed two things, one that was considered and one that was done. City Manager? Well, the, the ordinance that we passed made it more difficult for a golf course to turn into a anything else other than open space. Right. Um, it would have to, um, we established a process in which uh, the PUD and, and the people that live around, and that live in the PUD, um, to make the basic decisions of what happens to that particular property. So we, we, we established a process. Um, the PUD requires that to be open space. Um, and so to, to, we made it a little bit more difficult for the golf course to be developed into homes or apartments or anything else in that regard. Um, we're continuing to uh, work uh, with our, our golf courses there to make sure that they remain golf courses, for sure. Uh, what are we looking at for price range on these townhomes? Don't know yet. Um, I think when we, um, it will depend a lot on where the market is at the time. Um, I think the units that we showed in the prior pictures, um, we had a, a conversation with our client about the price point for these similar units. These are, again, down in the Orlando market closer. The ones on the top are selling for almost a half million apiece. So um, I don't expect you to have that same price point here, but you would be probably at the higher end of townhomes within DeBerry. Uh, one last thing before I uh, hand uh, the mic over to Jim. Um, I met my wife on a blind date in DeBerry. We got married at Gemini Springs. If I could say no to every damn development in DeBerry, I would. But you learn when you get up here that you can't, you just can't. We have a fiscal responsibility for the city of DeBerry and its residents. And to say no, if we, if we all said no, now you're talking about going into a lawsuit and they get expensive. And we end up losing. And you end up back where you started again. It's frustrating. It really is. But I do appreciate that you took something very large and made it a lot smaller. And I, I thank you for listening to the residents. I really do. And we do care up here. This council cares. We read social media. It just, it, it's just frustrating. Thank you. Council Member Papillardo. Um, so I appreciate the concession so far. I feel like um, that meets in the middle on several items from that community meeting. Sure. Um, just a few clarifying questions. The only ingress and egress is high banks, right? That's correct. Um, we, we actually taught, had conversations with city staff in the very beginning about connecting into the existing road network in Glen Abbey as well. Um, some communities like that because it provides that grid network or a little bit more connection point. Um, some communities actually require it. Um, but here, that was a clear preference not to do that. So we, we left that um, off the table as we put the design together. I appreciate that. I think that makes sense. Um, that stormwater pond, is that a new structure to that property? It will be. Um, so we're required to separate the stormwater from the site, um, from No Name Lake and from any other stormwater system. So um, that would be a standalone system that would be constructed to serve this site and maintained by the association for this, this property. Understood. Um, that interior piece of wetland, that is completely preserved? That is. You can see the wetland area and then the dashed line around the outside of it is actually the upland buffer. So we're preserving the wetland and the upland buffer associated with it. Very, very good. Um, so road impro improvements, we, in the meeting we discussed proportionate share. Yes. Um, I don't, 
I don't think it's anything that we can stipulate now, but um, of course that there's a the potential that there would be a proportionate share charged against the the development, particularly in high banks and improving the intersection. The intersection is very difficult. It's got very short turning lanes, for example. Um, that's more of a comment, I suppose. Um, perhaps the manager, could you highlight, or, or Mr. Bapp, um, highlight any notes that might be valuable to know about proportionate share and the potential of improving the 1792 intersection in high banks? Well, as you know, from this has been when you when you when you make amendments to the PUD, it's it's really all in negotiations and everything else. And the traffic impact analysis is going to provide the data of what's allowed, what's not, uh, what's required, and what's not required. And so, yeah, it's a negotiation going forward. Um, we had just Mark and I had uh, had discussions regarding you know turning lane you know turning lanes into the property, as well as my possible extension of the turning lane left hand turn lane in High Banks, and a possible right hand turn lane on uh, on where High Banks in 1792 is. Uh, we also talked about the sidewalk going all the way up to, to Walgreens, and so these are these are some of the things that uh, are still yet to be refined and, and making sure we get in there. Uh, looking at the best interest, our job as staff is to is uh, once we we leave here today, and, and if if you all do approve this on second reading, is to make it compatible with with the rest of the community. Um, and but again, it's based upon statistics. Florida statutes governs a lot of things of what we can and cannot do. Um, so it's it's a uh, it's a give and take. And uh, just like, for example, the fence. Um, and giving up the the green space and stuff like that it's a give and take and so that's what this whole process is all about uh, is to come down uh, once you get down to the give and take on both sides is to come down hopefully have a, uh, a project that's compatible and um, is a benefit to the community very good um, so considering in fact when it comes to conformity code I, I, I think that the usage of these units is consistent with the MPD and perhaps an improvement that the reduction of almost 75 percent fewer units is very attractive um, that's the end of my comments thank you council member stevenson thank you um i guess in all my years of being involved here in city government um, i would echo what council member sell says sometimes it's very difficult we want to listen to the residents and just rubber stamp no on everything but also knowing that this MPUD was here before we were ever elected, before we were even really a city, it was approved by the county. Um, and then to see this plan come forward with less units, less density, um, this really is the best case scenario for this property and for our community. Um, as far as the traffic improvements, again, just to reemphasize for the, for the residents, that comes after this part, just like the schools approval and their input comes after this. It doesn't, and stormwater, it doesn't make sense for these higher entities, and I'm, I'm more just speaking to the audience here, um, for them to go through the approval process and then risk the city saying no and they go through all that work. So, that, so we're going through the steps. First we review it, and overall um, I'm really impressed at how much you listen to the residents and their concerns, um, hearing your rebuttal for um, all these different issues, um, being willing to close off the roads from the other communities. I had that question also because some communities, like you said, it, it does go through. If they didn't want it to go through and we're putting up fences, I'm happy that that concession was made. As far as the uh, wildlife, you said protected species. Now, are bears considered a protected species? No, they're not protected in, okay. in Florida at this, at this point in time. So I didn't um, think so either. Yeah. But, I mean, it is something, if you encounter it when you're on the site, typically uh, our experience, and I'll speak just from talking to the wildlife biologists that we work with in the process of development most of the time, that they tend to move to another area as an area is getting is being dis sure. disturbed. Yeah. And so that, you know, what I think DeBerry has done a good job of and what um, Volusia County has done a good job of is making sure we have those areas preserved. And so here you've got the areas all along, you know, out by the river. You've got obviously Alexander Island and the and the new um, conservation areas. You know there there are more and more places for them to be able to to go to that are preserved um, based on the sure. policies that, that the city and the county have pursued. But we don't have crossing guards for the bears. That's true. For 1792. Um, so I, I guess just relating back to the fact that the residents have said that there are bears in the area. How is the trash 
going to be for these townhomes? Is it going to be individual cans or are they going to be having dumpsters? This would have, I believe this site would be set up to have individual cans. Um, okay. So, and they would have garages for the cans to be stored in. So. Okay. so it would be up to individual homeowners and residents to make sure that they're uh, using bear safe practices with their garbage, which of course we always encourage and right. um, there are bear proof cans for that. Um, You had also mentioned that they would be willing to completely eliminate the future possibility of multifamily homes and, and solidify the agreement that this is going to be townhomes only, that there's no changes in the future. I would like to see that formalized um, just because this is such a downgrade, you know, mm -hmm. from the apartments to the townhomes. And I hope that the, under, the, the residents do understand um, that this is better than what it could have been with apartments right there in the center of town, that apartments would have had a much bigger impact on our roads and our schools and all these other issues that we've addressed. And I'd like for that to be formalized in our agreement. That's uh, the end of my comments. And I think if, if you make a motion that is stipulated on that, yeah. we'll make sure we work with uh, your staff and legal counsel to revise the uh, development agreement to have that as a strike through. Thank you. Vice Mayor Butlin. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm not going to go through all the comments that have already been addressed because I've been writing notes. Um, thank you for meeting with the community and hearing them again. Um, it's been great. I know I live in a development that they said, oh, back in the day we used to hunt here, we used to do this. I'm like, okay, well, I'm glad my house is here now. You know, um, can anyone in the room tell me what was in their what was on their property before their house was? And it's not it's not something you can do because you don't really know. And you just build these houses. And I'm hoping that we can move the bears and not have them cross any streets because immediately around them there is no other way to go. Sure. So um, if they're there and they can be moved, I would rather see them move than rely on them just going away one day. Because um, I've seen them hit on high banks, and I really don't want to see that again on the on the west side. Um, but this will not, in my opinion, bring down the value of your home. What was proposed there could have. To have apartments come in and renters, um, these, are, these are owners, these are people that will live there and hopefully take pride in ownership. And they're, if they rent it to someone, you can't stop that now from your neighbor next door anyway, from renters coming in anywhere you live. So um, I'm not gonna go through all that again. But I really don't think, and I've obviously the traffic study will deal with as we get our um, applications in and all that stuff going. So I'm looking forward to seeing all that. But I like the way this is going. I think it's the right move. I think it's great for this area and we just need to move forward. Thank you. Okay. Um, I already had circled. I am strongly in favor of eliminating multifamily from the from PUD the agreement. And so if we get to a point of a motion that entertains approving this ordinance on first reading, I would ask that that be a, a criteria for such approval if that's where we go. Um, septic and sewer, and that was a question about capacity in DeBerry. DeBerry has its own septic, uh, its own sewer processing plant at the corner of Donald E. Smith and Plantation Boulevard. Boulevard. And that was expanded and upgraded a few years ago. And there is an additional expansion, county planned, county funded, that is underway to meet the needs of the, the residences that are being approved in DeBerry. The ones you've referenced in the south of town as well as any new ones here. We would not have septic here at all. There isn't room for septic. It's inappropriate. It's next to wetlands. It's next to water features. That will be on the sewer system. And yes, Volusia Utilities is expanding that facility uh, to meet the needs of developments that they also approve. They have capacity to, to accept. So it will not be septic, it will be sewer, and it, the capacity issue has been addressed, I believe, with the Volusia Utilities. If this particular developer has not gotten that approval, if there's no utilities capacity available, he can't build. Um, that's, it's, it's that simple. Um, schools. There 
the school board currently is working on plans to build a K to eight within the city of DeBerry. This is part of the school rezoning that you may have read about in the paper where 169 students from DeBerry Elementary have been rezoned to go to Enterprise next year for the construction period of said new school in DeBerry, at which point a couple of years from now, the plan is according to the school board, and that's all them. We don't have any say so in how they operate, but it's my understanding they have said publicly and decided publicly that in a couple of years, Enterprise School will be closed down and then all those students who will be DeBerry students will come back to DeBerry to the new school. So there is school capacity, there are school capacity plans. It's not the city's purview. The permission and the certification does not come from the city. It comes from the school board and any developer has to get those reservations in as Mr. Watts has said. Um, conservation easement for the vulnerable lands that we're talking about here, the wetlands and the, the, the part of uh, No Name Lake. I hope that some of the council saw the reaction of those in the audience. There is, from that reaction, the people who are represented here, I saw uh, flinching, which means I don't think they want, I think that if we held a community meeting about adding infrastructure there to draw people for recreation, that we would get a lot of pushback, that's an aside. But the idea that we would have it conserved under a conservation easement, which indicates only passive use by any council in the future, um, I could support that. On the fence and the buffer, I was looking at aerial photographs because I was trying to imagine this adjustment. And also in light of the email from 111 Pine Side Drive, there is a lot of natural vegetation along that side of this property. A lot of palmetto and that kind of thing. When, then I was also doing my job looking at our workshop data which had to do with our land development code. And somewhere in all of this, I saw something that said in a development, the buffer would be there and the fence would be on the other side of the buffer with the development. You are saying the fence would be on the property line. I'm assuming you mean the line that abuts houses like the four shown, one of which was 111 Pineside Drive. I have two comments. One is, to the greatest extent possible, I want to see that natural vegetation stay. It's tall, it's mature, it's dense, it's bushy, it is far, far, far better than three inch saplings that might grow up to be big trees when, when I'm no longer with the city. I'm in the land somewhere, uh, <laughs> prone. Um, I would like to see to the extent possible all of that natural vegetation that already exists in that vegetation buffer not touched. To that end, rather than clearing out a clear path for the fence, which is going to mean cutting back some of that stuff, mm -hmm. I personally, and this doesn't need to be part of the motion, I'm giving you feedback, sure. as some of the residents have given you feedback, I personally would prefer to see the fence like it was described somewhere in the code that I was reading for whatever, which is on the prop on the townhouse side of the vegetation, vegetative buffer, so that the houses see right now what they see right now. Sure. That would be my preference, and I'm seeing some heads bobbing at the back. Um, so, Mr. Watts, yes, do you believe that that scenario, rather than clearing out so you can put Dave's fence or whoever you use to put something on the property line, could put that fence inside the vegetative buffer instead? Um, I think that's certainly a possibility. Um, what I could suggest is let me verify that with our engineers. They're not here tonight just okay. to make sure that works. I can confirm 
the the uh, the intent on those land, on those buffer areas is to maintain the existing vegetation right. and supplement it as need be. Perfect. Um, I just I, I, I just have seen what replaces. Yep. It's like no, it's easier for our bulldozer to get through here if we take right. all the palmetto out. Yep. And I'm saying no. It takes a long time to replace that kind of vegetation, and in fact, many times it never gets replaced. Madam so, Mayor, I'd just ask if you'd permit me. Uh, let yes. me work on trying to get an answer to that okay. by second reading. If we, assuming we have a second reading, and then we can. City Attorney, do, do, do we need to do that in the motion, or can we just let that be something that might be added in second reading, and then I could say my piece again on second reading if it isn't there? Um, if every, I mean, it can be done in the motion, but then everybody'd have to agree to it. Um, uh, obviously, yeah. I don't. And uh, it's not a one man. Or we can one just try to work vote. on it and see if it can be verified. Um, I do also want to note, however, that as the ordinance is presented in today's agenda, uh, it still includes multifamily as a permitted use. And we would. And so we need to clarify that's being right. eliminated. That in the has motion. to be in the motion for sure. Yeah, and also the removal of the boat and RV storage because that's still that needs need. to be in that's the correct. that needs correct. to be in the ordinance. And but my preference for this vegetative buffer fence juxtaposition. I am comfortable that it doesn't need to be in the amendment, uh, but could be a staff and applicant discussion between now and second reading, at which time I would expect whatever is possible mm -hmm. would be included. And for the residents, um, that I think would be better. But if there are residents that want, say, no mayor, you don't know, I live there, I want that, that brown panel fence right along my property line, then you write us an email <laughs> and come to the second reading and we'll hash it out. But when I looked at the aerial, that was my concern. We've got a natural vegetative buffer. Let's use it. Let's not try to recreate something with it. Um, Just as a point of clarification, this is not a rezoning. This is changing one use in the PUD to another use, and if the will of this council through a vote sustains it, eliminating the existing use, which would be far denser, and perhaps have more people uh, not be as light on the land, and I understand you don't think this is light on the land, folks, but it's far lighter than apartment buildings, which could be 200 feet by 200 feet by code, as best I can read it. Um, the other thing that I do want to say that I feel strongly about and appreciate with this plan is we are not getting any mitigation credits for wetlands. The existing wetlands, which I feel very strongly we have to preserve what we've got left, are being preserved in this plan. And I can't tell you how many other projects require filling in a wetland to make it work. And then they buy credits, but where are those credits? They're not in DeBerry, but they are legally in the area that is considered to include DeBerry. Most likely Farmton, which if you're familiar with that, that's a good ways from DeBerry. It doesn't really help filter the, the storm runoff and everything else that these wetlands take care of in DeBerry. So I, I am very appreciative of the protection of the existing wetlands. Um, bears tend to move on their own. They move on their own. They're sporadically in my neighborhood down by the river, and then they move on, and they will do their own thing. Um, and the protected species, there's all sorts of rules for that. You will have to comply with that. This does not, amateur biologist, this does not look like scrub jay territory. It's way too wet. And it, in fact, it does not look like prime gopher tortoise area either. Again, they tend to like drier land. Although there may be parts of this parcel that are dry enough to, to host. That will all be taken though under consideration by existing rules and laws and things that this applicant will have to, to uh, abide by. I do have one question too that hasn't come up and that is in most of our developments we require trails. 
City Manager, is there a trail here? Well, there's no trail through the uh, through the development. I, I believe when they amenitize around the, the wetland in the middle, um, I think there will be walking areas inside the uh, inside the subdivision. This would be around the stormwater pond, perhaps. Um, they, they could amenitize the stormwater pond or around the existing wetland. They got a, uh, the area around there. There is going to be an eight foot sidewalk in, in front of the entire uh, prod property, um, and uh, uh, that will provide uh, access and, and mobility uh, up and down high banks uh, right. in addition to what's already there. So that's um, uh, that's an important feature that we want to make sure that's there as well. So uh, there could be some amenitizing around the stormwater pond for the residents. Is that called trails? The amenitized? Uh, well, it's not part? trails that, that connect, but the side. No, I mean, for, for the residents, is that a walking trail? Is that a possibility? Uh, that's a, amenitizing the, the stormwater ponds, we, we encourage that, that, that uh, they, um, and so uh, they may get park impact fee credits for, for doing those trails, amenitizing the parks around, amenitizing the trail around the, the stormwater or even around the wetland area. Um, and, uh, but the, the eight foot sidewalk is going to be the trail that connects them to all the other trails uh, okay. in DeBerry. All right. Um, applicant. Yes, <laughs> Walking trail. Is there a place in this plan that you could see and he keeps using amenitize. I want the word trail. Sure. Um, <laughs> so we have, we have sidewalks. Because amenitize yeah. could be picnic table. Um, <laughs> we have sidewalks included throughout. Um, okay. The, the site is, is pretty tight. It, uh, it is. That's why I'm point. asking. So if you look at every place where you see a road, those would also have sidewalks. And if, okay. you, if you look back to the picture there, you can yeah. see those have a sidewalk that right. goes throughout the neighborhood. Yeah. That, I, you know, I think the way that the, the site lays out, that would then connect down to the, the trail that the city manager referenced along High Banks. So okay. I think there would be plenty of places to walk within the neighborhood and also to access that external. I like pathway. trails and I see that stormwater pond. Just yes. think about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's, that's not a commitment. Sure. Um, okay. I don't have any further questions or comments. So is there further discussion by anyone on the council? If not, I would entertain a motion. And, and just, to, just to remind you, the motion, um, just to kind of guide you here, the attorney said you, you're, if you're going to approve, um, it's a, a motion to approve ordinance 07-2024, uh, amending the ordinance uh, section two, uh, removing the multifamily and removing the RV boat storage out of the ordinance. I'll make a motion to approve the first reading of Ordinance 07-2024, amending the Swallows Planned Unit Development, adding certain permitted uses to the development agreement, and removing the multifamily aspect, as well as removing the RV storage. And boat. And boat storage. No, I'll second. Council Member Stevenson? Yes. Council Member Sell? Tonight. I'm going to vote no, not because it's cool and hip, but because I want to see the second reading and see it cleaned up a little bit. Sure. Instead of promises, I want to see it in writing. Absolutely. Thank you. Councilmember Papillardo? Yes. Vice Mayor Butlin? Yes. And I am a yes. I appreciate your time this evening. We'll come thank back you. with uh, the much. answers uh, to the questions that were lingering. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you who came out. Sometimes the pro the the process is laborious, but it is the way that government works in the state of Florida, and we comply with that because that is the best way to run your city. Um, so we are moving on to council members' reports and communications. Council Member Sell, do you have anything to report? I'm a mess, and I want to go home, and I'll let you talk about Residing Hope. Thank you. Council Member Papillardo. Um, on Monday, I attended the Opioid Abatement Funding Advisory Board, as I was appointed to. Um, we have some grant opportunities coming up. I've told our government affairs officer about that. <clears throat> they are seeking alternatives, al alternate appointments, so that's something that I'd like council to consider for next meeting. Perhaps that can be a, an item on the agenda that we make that alternate appointment. Um, there was feedback that there was not, it was too much... Um, law enforcement and governance as the membership of that board and they're looking for people more personally affected by the opioid crisis. Um, so this is not an elected 
Correct. alternate, it would be perhaps Person. a community alternate. Correct. Okay. Um, the next meeting is on June 21st where we will be distributing up as much as $4 million of grant funding into the community. Um, they have received $7 million through the settlements from state and federal lawsuits with roughly 20 million more to come over the course of 16 more years. Um, and then Arbor Day tree giveaway is on April 4th, 6th, Saturday be there. Um, River Run 5K at Gemini Springs. I'm running as DeBerry's elected to complete the three-peat and beat all the other electeds because- Excellent. I love Good, doing that. I'm not running that. <laughs> That's on April 13th. It's the Rotary's putting on, it's a great cause. Go run that. And that is it. Thank you. Council Member Stevenson? Nothing to report, thank you. Vice Mayor Butlin? Okay, I've been busy. I attended a board dinner for Team Volusia with Shari, um, Government Affairs, and which was interesting. They talked about um, commerce and stuff, which is a little crazy right now in Tallahassee, so the exchange is there. I attended the great ethics training. Um, also the round table, which is kind of interesting. It's got had some good topics. Um, you did a wonderful job at the State of the City, and thank you, staff, for putting that together. That thank was a great, staff. the that was a great opportunity. I also attended the Belusia League of Cities board meeting, um, which we talked about upcoming events and things that were going on. I also attended the DeBerry Parks and Rec meeting, community meeting, and that was a great thing. And I got to participate in the School of Government and explain to the kids that were graduating from that class on, they were so excited to be here, and they did a mock council meeting. So it was, they did an ordinance, they did the whole thing, and they were so, so into it. So it was really good to see, and they were a really good class. Um, and of course, I've been on Florida League of Cities calls with um, the final summary of all the bills that have gone to the governor on their way. And that's it for me. Okay. Busy for me too. Some of them are duplicates. I did attend the sheriff's seminar on scams here at in Chambers, and that was a very interesting presentation. People ha have been gotten, have been taken for substantial sums into Barry since the 1st of January. And so it was a very interesting presentation. Um, I also completed ethics, attended the elected roundtable, presented State of the City, went to the regional meeting of Parks and Rec professionals that our city co-hosted with the county at DeBerry Hall, participated in the University High School of Government's mock city council meeting in our chambers. That was the final meeting of their class for the year. They were quite uh, engaged as the vice mayor said. She, was, she spoke to them earlier before I came at the end. Um, it was a very good class. We spoke, I spoke to them on the first day of their school year and then uh, helped give them their certificates on the last. And I attended the day on campus and rebranding celebration for the Florida Methodist Children's Home, which is now known as Residing Hope. And that was this past Saturday, very well attended. Many uh, people there from all across the county. And I have something to share with you this evening. You've heard me share this before, and that is um, our city manager's anniversary <laughs> of employment is April 1. Really? So five years, April 1. Each year I pass out, and I will provide you with this now. Thank you. A copy of a city manager evaluation form. Oh, I, got, I got two. Okay. And there's another one. Okay. And the evaluations will be individual. Should you desire to give uh, the city manager feedback on his performance, this is a form that I would recommend that you use. It covers uh, a number of facets of his job. And you can do so and meet with him one-on-one -on -one, and it will go into his personnel file. You give it to Wendy Cullen. You may also choose to provide him feedback verbally in a meeting or on the phone. Or you may choose to decide that your interaction with him weekly or however frequently you interact with him, uh, you use that opportunity all the time to give him feedback and it's sort of a continuing process. So I leave it up to you individually, but just to highlight, this is the annual uh, anniversary of his employment with the city of DeBerry, five years 
on mm -hmm. April 1. Congratulations and thank you for all your work. Thank City you. manager. Thank you very much. Um, I look forward to it. As I always say, uh, I don't think any of you have any hesitation to evaluate me on a daily basis. Nope. So uh, th thank you very much. Um, no, just one thing, Mayor. Um, our city attorney, Giff Chumley, this is his last meeting. Uh, he is moving on from Fishback Law Firm. And, and uh, should I tell him where you're going? Oh, boy. It's, it's official now. So. Okay. Uh, so he's going to Volusia County. Um, and he's going to be their attorney with Volusia County and their team. So we, we call that, do we call that the dark side? I, I think <laughs> that's how you were so it. Yes. <laughs> but no, uh, he's done yeoman's work for our city. And um, uh, thank you for championing a lot of uh, resolutions and ordinance and piggybacks and outstanding work. And, and we're certainly going to miss you. So Yay. appreciate it. Thank you, Carmen. I appreciate that. Thank you. City Attorney, do you have anything to share? Well, Carmen already reported the only thing I was going to report, so uh, I, think I'm, I think I'm finished for the evening. But anybody who wants to come and see me, I'll be up there in DeLand on the third floor of the TCK building. So. Okay, thank you very much. Hearing no further business, we stand adjourned. <laughs>